Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. Still getting used to that adjustment where I'm not necessarily looking for your questions in the comment section anymore. You can leave them there, of course, but I can't guarantee that I will get them. But you can email them to me and I will definitely get them and put them in my queue. Okay, I really want to encourage everybody to check out the podcast I put up this week. It's not necessarily Scientology related, but um, we talked about some amazing things. My friend Gary Lulu and I went over his career and some, uh, you know, some politics, some interesting facts about the Middle East and cults and all kinds of stuff. So um, anyway, I hope you guys will check that out. We've got some really interesting questions this week, so I want to get right to them. I just want to remind everybody that um, this channel is fan-funded by you guys. And so if you like the work that I'm doing and you think that it is valuable and important and that it is uh, something that should be uh, gotten out to the masses, <laughs> then um, consider joining me on Patreon to support this channel. Every little bit definitely helps, keeps the lights on, keeps the show going. All right, now. Let's get to your questions. Dennis Fritz. Years ago, I took martial arts classes at a studio where many of the senior black belts revered the studio director with near religious awe. He was their master, their guru, their swami. They ascribed all sorts of mystical knowledge and spiritual wisdom to him. The irony was the director seemed to have no desire for such veneration. He did not appear to seek it, nor did he appear to exploit it in any way. Frankly, I even wonder how aware he was that a number of his longtime students viewed him in this manner. The need of mega maniacal cult leaders to acquire followers seems pretty straightforward. But what about the need of would-be followers to enter into guru-disciple relationships? There do seem to be people in the world who have such a need. What role, if any, do you see that playing in cult formation? Great question, Dennis. Thank you very much for asking me this, uh, because this is a key, key part of the whole picture, and not something that, of course, is readily apparent to people when they are first coming out of cult situations or abusive relationships or situations where, they're been, where they've been taken advantage of physically, mentally, spiritually abused. Um, you know, they, they look at the person, who, the abuser, as the, as the person who created the relationship, maintained it, was responsible for sustaining it, and, of course, laid in all the abuse. And it, rightly so. There's no, there's no effort here in my answer to this question to say that um, an abuser is not an abuser. However, <laughs> uh, it is an abusive relationship. That is the, the fundamental basis of a destructive cult, narcissistic relationship, same mechanisms are at play, and you takes two to play that game. Um, so how does this figure in? Well, there's all kinds of levels you could look at this at. We all are social creatures. I mean, let's just be really straight up that we all have a need for sociality, for getting along with other people. No man is an island, and if you get stuck out on an island, you're going to find out real fast just how badly your survival depends upon your interaction with other human beings. It's really in our DNA, literally. So how does that work? Well, you know, we, we, that our social skills or our social skill set is actually what enables human beings to be the dominant species on this planet and to have taken over and live in inhospitable environments, uh, conquer other creatures or situations that otherwise would be completely unconquerable or unmanageable by ourselves, right, as individuals. We could never take out, very, very, very few of us, I guess I could say, could individually take out a lion. But you know, uh, out on the African savanna, when we when we teamed up, uh, that worked, <laughs> and everybody benefited from that, and that's how it all started, or at least that's one way it it could have started. So, uh, okay, so that is a need we all have. It's a biological imperative. It's not just a nice idea. We need to be able to interact with other people. We need to be able to get along. Now, how do the cult leaders obviously take advantage of this? You've presented a situation where. A potential cult situation could exist in a martial arts dojo 
and definitely this kind of thing happens all the time. But what happens when the leader is not a narcissistic, you know, nut job and a person who, you know, craves domination over other people and yet he's building up a bunch of followers who are granting him a ton or her, works in either way, um, who are granting that person maybe more authority or putting more value on that person's statements or ideas or beliefs than maybe is healthy for them. Well, that's where you get to the other half of the cult equation, where you have followers. Followers um, have taken that need for the sociality, for a social, you know, existence, and they and they and they go all in on it. Okay, I mean, if you're looking at like what are they, what's going on in their head, they're looking for. Well, there's lots of different appeals. There's lots of different things they could be looking for. Approval uh, would be one. Um, recognition. I mean, for some, just rec you know, just being able to be recognized as a person is itself, um, you know, some people have had a real hard time with that in their life. Um, and they're, you know, if, if they're a little introverted, uh, if they are a little shy, if, if, other, if they have been bullied, if they have been um, abused in the past in some fashion or another, if they were raised in an abusive environment especially, this, um, this can be very, very difficult on their, on their psyche, right, on their, on their brain and, the, and what goes on up here. And, um, and it's no joke that when you overstress children, you create future problems that are going to stick with this person for the rest of their life uh, until they get some, some therapy or treatment. So when people like that go into these group situations, they're bringing a lot of baggage with them. And they're looking to an authority figure, uh, what, a teacher, a politician, a leader of some kind, any kind, who is sit sitting up there saying, I know... Uh, what to do or how to do this thing, and then the person who might be a little, you know, more invested than they should be in trying to get other people or a leader or leaders to direct their life because that's what they kind of were raised with or that's where they're coming from for whatever reason. When they go into a situation like that, then it's really, really easy for them to go into a submissive sort of uh, attitude. And, uh, and you get a bunch of these guys together, and you get a teacher who's actually a really good teacher or an instructor or, or whatever. And they just allow them, they, they kind of put too much into it themselves, right? It's basically, I, I think you get the idea of where I'm going with all this. So. Um, you know, it becomes a destructive cult when the leader then sees this and starts taking advantage of it. And it actually takes um, a, a great force of will on the part of some people to not go there, you know, for the, for the leaders to not do that because it's, it becomes so easy to take advantage. It becomes so, um, they're almost, they almost want you to. It seems like they, of course, they don't. Of course they don't. Nobody wants to be abused. Nobody wants to be taken advantage of. But they so willingly seem to put themselves in that position that there are some people who just go, well, they asked for it, right? And of course, you know, nobody asks for abuse. But, um, but to a certain mindset, that is the situation, and then they proceed to take advantage. It sounds like in this situation you brought up, Dennis, um, you had somebody who I, I doubt that this uh, martial arts studio director you're referring to here was completely oblivious to what was going on. It sounds like you had somebody who actually had some integrity and some idea of what it means to be a teacher um, who, who didn't take advantage. And I would like to think that that's more common than, you know, running into people who will take advantage. Um, I think that's true, actually. I think it's true that most people are like that, and, and the destructive cult leaders or people who will take advantage are, are few and far between. Um, you know, but we highlight all those cases here on this channel, so it's a little hard for me to say because I'm, I'm fully immersed in that world, and so I see it all the time. Um, but I, I optimistically think that, that most people are not like that. And of course, a good teacher or instructor is going to know that this kind of thing can happen. They're going to be aware of this fact, right? It really should almost be part of the, 
of the teaching of teachers <laughs> uh, or instructors that you know, hey, don't 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 take advantage of your students, right? And and I've seen that, and um, and that's that that's being an ethical leader or an ethical teacher, and uh, and we should encourage that kind of behavior because it's it's what we want. Tom Willett. You've mentioned how Scientology claims mental and physical well-being through following its programs. With this in mind, could you please explain how allergies are seen within the church, especially within the Sea Org? I know it's quite banal, but are they looked down upon as a failure to will themselves better? Conditions within the bases sound very tough, and I couldn't imagine that there would be too much sympathy or choices for staff members with allergies. Just hoping to get a little insight into the day-to-day -day running of the church. Hey, Tom, thanks for the question. This is actually a pretty big topic and one of interest because there is, well, there's a lot to say, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of ramble a little bit here and walk through some points that I want to make about it, and let's see where this goes. Um, first off, um, there is a um, specialized rundown or series of actions, and I'm going to go over what it is, uh, in the world of Scientology to address psychosomatic factors that could be underlying allergic conditions or asthmatic conditions. It's called the allergy or asthma rundown. And um, they, they make it very clear uh, in the text that it is not a medical claim and that it's only been shown to help some people relieve them of some of their allergic conditions. So they've, they've got their fine print all worked out. And ironically, given how these things happen and, and why there are psychosomatic um, factors involved in allergies or asthma, the environment itself that the Sea Org members find themselves in or that Scientologists can find themselves in could themselves be one of the, one of the, the, the triggers or reasons why the person has increased stress levels and, and reduced uh, immune system uh, function or you know, reduced uh, biofunction uh, because of the stress that they're under all the time. And so, ironically, they could be actually even causing some of the allergic reactions or at least, you know, in a, in a, in a way, not, not, it's, not a, it's not a boom, boom effect. It's more like all the stress is reducing the person's, you know, ability to fight back against pathogens and allergens and things. And then that increases the, the person's um, allergic reactions or problems with, uh, with allergies. And I looked into this a little bit because I got a little curious. I actually printed some stuff here that I'm going to go over with you. First off, um, to just say that this isn't all just in my head, um, this is a, from a New York Times article, and it says, are, all, are my allergies all in my head? No, but emotional factors can make allergies better or worse. Doctors have long suspected a connection between allergies and the psyche. Uh, in 1883, Dr. Morel McKenzie, a pioneer in the field of ear, nose, and throat medicine, observed it has long been noticed that attacks of prolonged sneezing are more apt to occur in persons of nervous temperament. And then there's more here about uh, observations with this stuff and, and working on it. Uh, a 2018 German study confirmed the effectiveness of placebos in patients with allergic rhinitis a medical name for hay fever. Allergic symptoms such as itching, sneezing, and runny nose improved even though the patients were aware that they were receiving a placebo. Um, and then I looked a little deeper and I found an actual science paper here uh, that was published uh, uh, on the NIH, National Institute of Health website, Psychosomatic Treatment for Allergic Diseases. And this was uh, from 2017. No, 2015, and just a couple highlighted parts I'll go over real fast on this. Psychosocial stress affects the nervous, endocrine, and immunological systems, which are involved in the onset and exacerbation of various diseases. Many studies have reported psychosocial influences on the onset and progression of allergic diseases, such as bronchial asthma and atopic dermatitis. Concerning asthma, a typical allergic disease often accompanied by psychosomatic problems, some preparation factors are inherent to the pathogenesis, such as atopic disposition and airway hyperresponsiveness, while others are acquired preclinical factors, 
allergens, air pollutants, psychosocial stress in childhood, character and behavioral problems. These inherent and acquired factors are together called preparatory condition, and asthma develops when an inciting factor, such as exposure to an allergen, catching a cold, or psychosocial stress is combined. Okay, in other words, what is all this saying? It's saying that if you stress people out, you can create conditions, physiological conditions, that will open them or predispose them to uh, allergic or um, asthmatic conditions. Okay, and if we look at David Miscavige as an example, stressful childhood, some uh, physical abuse, onset of asthma, he goes into Scientology, he gets some auditing, this relieves the asthmatic condition, which he, as I understand it, he actually does still suffer from. Um, Scientology didn't cure the asthma, but it, they probably did, well, they wouldn't have done this, because this stuff, the, this allergy rundown, which I'm about to go over with you, that is what Scientology does, uh, was uh, issued in 1985, but um, they, I thought you guys might be interested in this, in how this works. Um, sea Org members do receive an allergy or asthma rundown, not as a usual course of events. It's not like they're put on a priority list. If you have allergies in the Sea Org, um, they're going to tell you to basically suck it up and, and deal with it. And, and uh, they're not going to be super, super cool on you going and getting a bunch of prescription drugs or being on medications all the time because that gets in the way of... Uh, auditing. You're not supposed to be on a bunch of uh, medications or drugs when you're doing auditing in Scientology. And um, and they're just down on medicine kind of anyway because Hubbard says to solve it with Scientology. So in the course of the years that I was in Scientology, I did observe Sea Org members get allergy asthma rundowns from time to time. Very, very rare because not a lot of Sea Org members uh, have tons and tons of allergies. They might get, you know, onset of summer stuff if there's stuff in the air, you know, flying around in the air. But... Um, uh, or asthmatic conditions, but not, But I never, for example, knew any Sea Org members who had inhalers. Uh, actually, no, actually, no, I did know a couple. I did know one guy who had an inhaler. Um, and he and that kind of level of, of uh, allergy or asthma would definitely have that person uh, programmed for, you know, in his auditing for an allergy or asthma rundown with the hope that that would relieve it or resolve the condition entirely. If it didn't, the Scientology attitude about it would be to do more Scientology to handle it. Go further up the bridge because there are Dianetic processes or procedures that are run at the entry level to the bridge. And again, before you go clear, there's this thing called New Era Dianetics. I've broken all this down in other videos. New Era Dianetics would definitely be another w place where you could take pot shots at the allergy uh, or the asthma with auditing and try to address it. Different from what this is doing, this, this allergy asthma rundown is pretty lightweight stuff compared to going in on it with Dianetics. And then, of course, you have the OT levels where you're going to start going after BTs and body thetans, and you're going to um, start taking them out with the idea that perhaps one of them is causing or some, somehow that's causing your uh, allergy or, or asthma. Um, so I thought you guys might be interested in what the steps are of this. And I'm not going to go through every single thing here because i got to explain auditing procedure. But as far as could this action relieve somebody on a temporary basis of some of the psychosomatic or stress factors or other factors that might be precipitating allergy, and I think it could. Um, for example, the first thing you do is you go on an e-meter and you assess these items, right? Allergy, poison, medication, virus, bacteria, sickness, influence, stress. The auditor literally sits with an e-meter and says these words to the preclear while they're obviously holding the cans and notes down any reaction to these words. And if they're, that whatever one reads the biggest or the most is then going to be put into this question where they're going to ask, what might have the effect on you of, let's say, the, let's say the biggest item that reads on here is uh, sickness. Okay, so what might have the effect on you of sickness? And the guy goes, what might have the effect of me on me of sickness? Well, 
let's see, pollen, um, germs, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. He answers all these questions. My mother, I mean, who knows what he's going to say. And then they take that and they find whatever the, the biggest thing is on that. And the guy should just from that, he should have some kind of a, oh, kind of moment, a aha moment. Oh, look at that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the sickness. It was my mother. Oh, every time I was around my mother, I started feeling this way. Well, if his mother was a stressor for him, if his mother was an abuser, if his mother was somebody who, you know, he wasn't comfortable being around for whatever reason from time to time, she might come up and he might see that and go, oh, my mom, stress, right? He wouldn't even say stress. He would just go, oh, my mom, yeah, she used to, every time I was around her, I used to get, I used to feel all this tightness in my throat, you know? And that could all by itself relieve some of the stress. That actually could work. Now, am I going to sit here and say that will work? Absolutely not. Am I going to say that you should go get this? Absolutely not. <laughs> because there's many ways of arriving to the conclusion that your mother might have stressed you out when you were a kid. And that could have predisposed you to an allergic or asthmatic situation, right? There's lots of ways you could arrive to that conclusion without having to go pay thousands and thousands of dollars to Scientology and go through their whole abusive indoctrination and all the rest of it. Uh, I'm just pointing out here, I wanted to go over this with you guys because I wanted you to see how some of the techniques of Scientology do almost accidentally get to what actually is causing a condition to occur because people assign, you know, oh, well, I got the allergy rundown or I got the asthma rundown and I don't have asthma anymore and so it's clearly Scientology works and, and this is one of those examples where I thought it might be useful to point out that, yeah, no, it wasn't really the Scientology. It was you were finding the stressors. You were finding the things that were actually causing the physical, you know, problems. And by relieving some of that, you relieve some of the physical problems, right? And there are a couple processes you could run in this. Let's say that it comes up that the guy, um, you know, is it, that his mother comes up, right? Okay, so it's his mother. Uh, that was the, you know, what might have the effect on you of sickness? Well, it was my mother. Okay, good. Boom. The meter reads. Wow, that's amazing. And then they run this process and they say, how could you waste mother? And how could another waste mother, right? And how could others waste mother? And then they, once that's run, that little process is run, and you sit there and think about ways you could not have to listen to your mother, or deal with your mother, be around your mother, or whatever is going to answer those questions for you. Again, you're, de you're removing some of the stressful factors out of your memory and out of your uh, you know, recalls of how you experience your mom. And then you go to how could you have mother? How could another have mother? How could others have mother? And you run that little series of questions on the guy. So it's not just wasting mom, it's also having mom. So it's a back and a forth and a back and a forth. So you look at it both ways. Um, anyway, that is an example of how uh, Scientology is done, how Scientology auditing is done. And I hope I've shown through this that you know, that, that, that it wouldn't require all of that nonsense with an e-meter and, and with an auditing session and thousands and thousands of dollars laid down to even get to that point in order to get to the root cause of the psychosomatic illness or problem and relieve some of that, right? And that's that's kind of what I was trying to do with this. So anyway, um, hope that helped. Kevin Zay. I've heard that the level of involvement with multi-level marketing schemes is extremely high within the Mormon faith. I'm wondering how prevalent MLM involvement is within Scientology. I do know the majority of those that get involved with MLMs tend to be women. I'm also aware of the fact that women in Scientology do not have the same issues as those in the LDS Church as far as their levels of allowed participation within the organization. That being the case, I would not be surprised if the level of MLM involvement in Scientology was comparatively low due to the disparity in the amount of free time females have within those groups. Well, that's an interesting take, Kevin, and uh, you might have a point there. I'm not really sure, but um, 
But as far as MLM activity in Scientology goes, I am aware that there is activity with that uh, on the part of men and women. My folks got involved with Amway, as I've said a few times, during the 80s uh, while they were involved in Scientology. There was also a music thing, I think, they got involved in, but I don't think that was, that was sort of MLM, but it was more one of those, uh, you know, get pirate copies of, <laughs> of, of cassettes uh, for, cheap, you know, for dirt cheap, right? Um, I did not, uh, you know, outside of my own experience in the 80s, uh, as I was growing up and my parents were doing that stuff, once I started working for the church and then later was in the Sea Org, I didn't see a lot of directly of MLM involvement with Scientologists, but you hear about it from time to time and you hear about people taking it being um, not taken advantage of, but just investing money in that. And then, you know, when I was a reg, for example, when I was selling Scientology to people for a period of time, you know, those kind of things would always sort of get in my craw a little bit. I'd be like, what? what? They're doing what? They're some MLM thing. What's, what's that? You know, and, and you be, and you try to discourage it because you wanted all their money. I want all of it. So stop putting it over there. Uh, of course, the idea with the MLM is that by doing that, they're going to make money so that they can pay for Scientology. And I guess in a couple of cases, that's been, that's worked out for people. But most of the time, these MLMs are just total money traps and they are little cults in themselves. And as I've commented many times about uh, Amway specifically, you know, it, the, the product of Amway is not the little the little cleaning stuff and, and clothes and other things they sell, the product is you, <laughs> you selling other people and selling them on selling with the CDs and DVDs and stuff. So it tends to, you know, only work for the, the people at the very, very top. Um, so I could not actually honestly tell you uh, from a big picture view whether there are more or less, you know, percentage-wise or per capita or whatever, people involved between Mormons and Scientologists, I can just say that I, um, I know that Scientologists are very open to the idea of get-rich-quick schemes or things that can make them money so they can do the bridge. And they tend to park their ethics at the door if it's in service of getting money or financing to do more Scientology. So, you know, so, so I, that's, that's pretty much what I can say about that. And I know it's not a you know, a really involved, deep, full answer on that. But I, my involvement with it and exposure to seeing people working on MLMs while, sci while doing Scientology was, was kind of minimal. So that's, that's what I can say about that. Preacher1138. If Sea Org members don't have health insurance, how do they handle medical bills if they have to go to the doctor or be hospitalized for an extended period of time? Seeing as medical bills can become very large very fast, it would seem to be a major issue to pay off medical bills with no insurance. After being successfully treated for whatever medical issue the person had, would the Sea Org member be sec-checked for having withholds that caused their extended illness? Or what if somehow they had been put under psychiatric observation or suicide watch unbeknownst to Scientology and the church finds out after the fact? Would the person be declared a suppressive person or thrown into the hole? Okay, thanks for the questions here. And um, actually, the way Scientology, or specifically you're asking about the Sea Org, so that's where I'm going to focus my answer here, rather than the broad topic of all Scientologists, because all Scientologists, you know, they go to the hospital, they have health insurance through their work, or they buy private insurance, or whatever. But Sea Org members don't. The Sea Org members, one, can't afford personal health insurance, and uh, the Sea Org itself does not provide anything like that. So what happens when somebody goes to the hospital? And we'll just head off a bunch of these questions before they would even become a situation because instead of Sea Org members being left on their own to go deal with their medical bills or accumulate medical bills, what happens is they immediately go in uh, like to an emergency room usually or if they had a real serious situation like cancer or something, they go in and they basically apply as low income charity cases. They go into the hospitals and they take advantage of whatever programs are available on the public dole to be taken care of. This happened to me a few times when I went into the hospital. I had uh, one time I had to be held overnight for observation of my heart. Another time I had a um, broken finger 
and other times I went with other people to the hospital and watched what down, went down with them. And there was all, and by the time I was going to L.A. County Hospital and getting treatment for problems that I was having or observing others doing it, it had already been all worked out with the hospital that if somebody was coming from the C organization or the Church of Scientology, they were going to be put on one of these low-income programs because it was already worked out that we were not making any money. And we were not going to be able to pay for prescriptions, and we were not going to be able to pay for medical care, and so we were going to ask the public to do it, uh, the public at large. And this was this was why I say it's sort of a charity thing. And there are such programs, and that was how I was able to get any treatment at all. Um, I've extended that to everybody else who goes in from the Sea Org because this is what we were told to do, and it and it worked. So um, so that's so they don't accumulate personal debt. And Sea Org members also almost always, I mean, it's very rare that a Sea Org member would just show up at the hospital by himself or herself. They always go in pairs, sometimes threes. I mean, when I was on the RPF, you couldn't leave the base unless there were two other people with you, not just one. So you're always got somebody around with you, you know, or almost always. Very, very rare that that's not the case. Um, and so you show up there you're not going to end up on suicide watch or, you know, in some kind of situation with a psychiatrist. One, no Sea Org member would ever, ever, ever consent to a psychiatrist having anything to do with their care. I mean, you just have to say the word psychiatrist and you will get almost violent reaction. Uh, to me, as a Sea Org member, the most terrifying thing that could ever happen to me that I could imagine was ending up involuntarily committed in a psych ward. I, I could not imagine anything more terrifying than that. I mean, it just, you know, I uh, remember that old movie, Jacob's Ladder, you know, <laughs> like I had, I had real visions of, of it being like the ninth level of hell. So you are never gonna see a Sea Org member consent to psychiatric care of any kind, seeing a psychologist, having anything like that happen. Um, and if they were truly suicidal, or, I mean, that's a whole other subject, but they don't send them to the hospital. If somebody in the Sea Org is, is suicidal or is claiming that they are feeling suicidal, they're put under Sea Org watch, and they are isolated and left, you know, and, and, and under, under guard and stuff, and, and they, get, um, they, get, they, they get out. They kick them out of the Sea Org as quickly as they can. Um, they do, you know, they do interviews with the person on the meter, they sec check them and they find out if it's real or are they just trying to get out of something. And, um, and if it's real, they, they get rid of those people as quickly as possible. They have learned their lessons about, you know, having suicidal people around and they don't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, the Sea Org has a real big aversion to dead bodies on their bases. So, um, okay, so as far as but going back to the hospital thing, uh, I just wanted to really stress that because the, when you ask about if somebody's put under psychiatric observation or suicide watch, that is never going to happen for a Sea Org member or, or a Scientologist going to get medical care. Um, they will always go to Scientology for the solution to that, not to psychiatrists. Um, so, so it sort of heads off the question of would they be declared a suppressive person or thrown in the hole? No, that's, that's not going to happen because it's never going to be a scenario that's going to occur. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the reasons, by the way, all of this that I'm sitting here talking about is one of the reasons why Sea Org members don't spend a lot of time in hospitals at all. They all hate them. They all think they're, you know, that they shouldn't uh, have much to do with medicine, that medicine is quackery and nonsense and pseudoscience. And, um, you know, and in some places, in some areas, they're right. Uh, but, um, but you still, if you're sick, you should go to the hospital. You know, if you have a broken bone, you should go to the hospital. Um, if there's something wrong, you know, go to the hospital. Get a, get a look at it, you know. Uh, sea Org members are, you know, solve it with Scientology. So that's, that's their attitude about that. Patrick Gavin. I saw a video of Miscavige on Ted Koppel's Nightline show in 1992. As a guy who was in, did you watch it? And did you and everyone else think at the time that CLB knocked it out of the park and defeated Koppel? The main thing I got out of it, after all of my exposure to Scientology critics, is that his really poor education was on full display. It was a disgrace. Koppel maneuvered him into so many corners, and other than changing the subject, he never escaped one of them. 
Okay, a couple points on this one. Uh, yes, I did watch it back in the day when it first came out in 1992. And, um, and of course, we all loved it, right? <laughs> As Scientologists, we all thought he definitely knocked it out of the park and he did a great job. And of course, Miscavige, I think, later bragged about something about, uh, I, think, I think that was an Emmy Award winning uh, show, Nightline, and that episode, uh, I think, was the one that got the Emmy, I, I think. And uh, I heard that Miscavige was bragging about how he had gotten Koppel an Emmy. Um, I actually re-watched it, uh, in it before I did this Q&A show here today in, 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 to, to address your question. And I'm going to disagree with you on the fact, on the point that Miscavige comes off as an uneducated idiot. Uh, just the opposite, you know, he uses uh, phrases and words and, and things that indicate that he definitely has education and, um, and it definitely is coming at this from a, you know, from a, a fairly uh, good, from a public relations point of view, he actually didn't do too bad of a job. He was, of course, talking to Scientologists, but this was also a period of time when the church was honestly trying to reach out more to the public, and Miscavige thought that this would be a good way to get the church's good name and um, good image out there to the public, and, you know, of course, that didn't really fly so well. And this was also at the time when the Time Magazine article had come out in 91, I think it was, and the church had spent, you know, I think $3 million, he said, on this 12-week advertising campaign in USA Today, where they did promote the principles of Dynamics and Scientology quite broadly on huge full-page ads in USA Today. And this went on for weeks. So, so that was a real honest effort on the part of the church to get the word out about what Scientology is and sort of diffuse the false data that they thought, you know, that was being propagated about the church, when really it wasn't false data, it was just, you know, the, the dark side of the church, the abuses and the financial crimes and stuff like that that the church has uh, always been engaged in was being exposed, and so the church was like, well, we're going to tell you our side. And that was the sort of cherry on top of the whole thing was Miscavige agreeing to go on to Koppel's show. He basically didn't do any worse of a job than almost any other, you know, spiritual leader, church leader, cult leader, or politician I've seen. And, you know, and, and in fact, some of his answers were a little bit more on point than others. Some, of course, were complete and utter lies. No question about it. I mean, whenever they got anywhere near Hubbard talking about crazy stuff, Miscavige deflected. He even said that there was a lecture where Hubbard had been talking about, you know, flying around in the Van Allen belts. And Hubbard literally meant that. Well, Hubbard wasn't joking around in his lecture. And Miscavige tried to diffuse that by saying, well, I've never heard that lecture. I don't know what you're talking about. That's no part of modern Scientology. Total lie. But, of course, that's, you know, that's where they went. And Koppel actually didn't pursue that line of inquiry as hard as I as I, in retrospect, wish he had, because they could have pursued the whole Xenu narrative and all of that as well, and gotten Miscavige on record uh, denying that maybe that Xenu was part of Scientology. That would have been interesting, if he cornered him on that. Um, and he did corner him on quite a few things. So, I, you know, so I'm not trying to come off here as a, as a, a, a Miscavige apologist or defender, because I'm not. You guys know I'm not. I'm just trying to say that I didn't think he came off as poorly as, as maybe you did. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and there's one other thing I want to comment on here about this, uh, and, and this is more to the broader picture of this stuff, um, because I was absolutely convinced when I watched that, and so were many other Scientologists, that he had done an Oscar-winning performance, that it was brilliant, and he was wonderful. And the reason for that, of course, is because I was watching all of that with my confirmation bias fully in place that Scientology were the good guys and David Miscavige was the leader of Scientology, so he was the white knight. And so I interpreted everything he said through that lens. And the framing, you know, the lensing, that, that is really important. That's really important. Because you watch that after being exposed to my work, Tony's work, Mike, Leah, as you said in your question. So you knew that everything he was saying was total horseshit, right? I mean, you knew that already. But for somebody who didn't and watches that fresh and new, which is kind of the perspective I tried to take in re-watching it to, in, to answer this question, 
I, you know, I saw that he came off as lucid, literate, um, responsive, argumentative, but in a way that felt um, like if he really believed all the things he was saying about the conspiracies and the government coming after Scientology and all of that, and it looked like he did, I believe that at the time that Miscavige gave this interview that he was still a true believer in Scientology. I don't think he was faking it when he was doing on all the things he was saying in this interview. I think he really believed what he was saying. I think Miscavige's fall from belief comes years after this. I think it actually, for me, I think it actually started or or became a thing around the time that the whole Lisa McPherson debacle occurred. I think that's when he started seeing that this was not, you know, uh, really the deal. Anyway, um, so that's all, that's all I want to say about that, but I hope that answers your question a little bit or addresses it and, and gives you, um, you know, maybe some things to think about. Julie Fabio. Ron Miscavige recently talked about his frustrations with our government. It seems as if not one politician in the U.S. says or does anything. Why is this? I really don't think they could get away with litigating the government to death again. We are in different times. Am I wrong to assume this? It boggles the mind that nothing is done. Are they simply afraid that it will hurt their career if they take on a church because of religious freedom? What is the reason nobody seems to do anything? This is a business. How on earth can they not see this? Oh, Julie. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I've addressed this before, but, you know, there was just an article put up about the IRS recently and how um, they simply don't have the manpower to even go after rich people. Because when you go auditing people who have a lot of money or wealth, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and takes more agents and it's more involved. So it's easier to go after the poor people. And so that's what the IRS does. You know, let's all, let's all remember that the IRS is, are, are not the good guys, right? These are the tax revenue collection uh, di division of the U.S. government, and uh, they're, they're taking money, right? <laughs> they're not the good guys. <laughs> but the problem is that, uh, you know, good or bad, however you look at taxes or however you look at all that stuff, um, uh, they are undermanned. The, the, the funding for the IRS has been being taken away by Senate Republicans, by the way. And so the amount of money that they have to invest in hiring more accountants, hiring more auditors, hiring more staff is less and less and less. And so they have been reduced in their manpower. Also, there are not even, as Jeffrey Augustine and I have talked about, they are not even the regional people and the people whose job it is to go after uh, organizations that are abusing like their charitable status or tax, re tax exempt status. Those people aren't even on the job. So you've really only got two people in the, in the entire government structure who can order or execute a, a program or plan to remove Scientology's tax-exempt status. One of them is the Secretary of the Treasury and the other one is the IRS Commissioner. And neither one of them are at all interested or have any compulsion or, or desire to go after the Church of Scientology given the bigger picture items that they are dealing with all the time. Scientology is a very small problem to them. And, uh, and there is no public, you know, huge public discourse on this. There's no Senate committees or investigations about this. There, in other words, there's no political will to do anything about this. And the IRS has got its hands full already to the point that they're not even auditing all the people they should be auditing, much less going after these organizations. None of what I'm saying excuses any of this or makes it okay or rationalizes it. And I'm totally not okay with any of this. It's just the situation. And it really kind of, and this is just one area. The FBI, not entirely different. Uh, local police, you know, the LAPD. I mean, the LAPD is kind of its own thing along with the Clearwater PD. Those guys are just bought off, period. I mean, they're just bought off. Um, but the FBI's not bought off. The IRS isn't bought off. They just don't want to take the trouble and they don't have any reason to do so uh, because they're not, the things that motivate them are not, you know, every little group. I mean, there are, there are 5,000 plus destructive cults in the world, hundreds, thousands of them in America of all different stripes, all different walks, all different sizes. 
and it would be wonderful if the IRS would man up and actually, you know, put some kind of task force together or put some sort of unit together to investigate these groups, audit the hell out of them, and take away their tax exemption when they found to be abusing it. But the IRS isn't motivated to do anything like that. And, uh, and in fact, like I said, up until I think this year, their funding was going down and down and down. And it takes a lot of money to take on a group like the Church of Scientology. The Scientology doesn't have anything else to do except fight for its survival with its billions of dollars. And the IRS does not have a budget like that. You know, if you look at the U.S. government as this monolithic organization where all of our money goes into it and they've got access to billions of dollars, you're looking at our government the wrong way. It doesn't work like that. It's broken up into all these different pieces and parts, and each different piece and part is allocated a certain amount of money, and they got to make, th make it work with what they've got. That's all they're going to get. And, you know, the, one of the ways that Scientology defeated the IRS back in 93 is they wore them down budgetarily. They went after them with suits. They went after them in the press. They went after them for years, not days, not months, years of campaigning against the IRS. And the IRS couldn't deal with it, you know, and they finally just like, okay, that's it. We're done. You know, enough. We'll, we'll give you the tax exemption, you know. And, uh, and of course, they, Scientology had to jump through some hoops to do that. But in the end, Scientology won bigly. And uh, the IRS, you know, kind of just was, was just tired of it, you know. So they're not in any way motivated to go back into it again. They don't have the money for it and they don't have the resources for it. And, and it's really a shame that that's where we're at with this, that it's that, you know, banal, it's that, like, stupid. But that, as far as I can tell, that's the situation. It's not a matter of individuals in the IRS don't see the threat of the church of Scientology or don't see the problem. It's not, I mean, hell, maybe the IRS commissioner even can see the problem. But what's he going to do? You know, and uh, what other priorities does he have on his plate? You know, I don't know what makes up that guy's day. So I'm not going to make stuff up and say, well, he's busy with other things. I'm just saying I don't know. Uh, but I do know for sure that the Church of Scientology ain't on his to-do list. And we have worked very hard to try to get it onto his to-do list, and we haven't really gotten there. Um, and, it, and I think it's going to require, it would require a lot more public awareness and a lot more public demand uh, than, we've, than we've generated. And that's kind of where that's at. So instead of trying to get the government to step in, and do something about this because it is endlessly frustrating. Leah has certainly been frustrated by it. I've been frustrated by it. All of us critics have been. Uh, instead, you know, we've got the civil suit route, which is active and moving right now, and that is very, very uh, a good way to go after them. Uh, and that's what we've got, you know, um, and I don't really know what else to say about that. I wish I had bigger, better answers, um, but, you know, this is kind of how this kind of, you know, if you want to call it evil or this kind of criminal behavior is allowed to go on is, is just because of the banality of the systems that we have and their inability to deal with um, groups that can outdo them or outlast them, you know, or wear them down. And that's where we're at. And I've also talked, of course, about the religious freedom aspect of this. And I, and I will say again that part of the picture here is not just government, you know, overburdened or underfinanced government divisions or organizations. It's also the fact that there is a huge, it is not small, it is not an insignificant number of people. It is a huge, huge lobby on the part of these churches because these guys are, are seeing the writing on the wall that they are not able to avoid criminal prosecution for child abuse or child sexual assault, uh, you know, or, or some of the stuff Keith Renier was getting up to with Nexium, where they were branding women. I mean, when it's that, oh my God, you know, then the, then the FBI will step up or then these guys will go in after them. And so the churches are seeing the writing on the wall here that now they're being gone after for criminal activity when they can prove it or show it or when it's that blatant and obvious. 
Um, and so they have increased the amount of lobbying and work that's being done in D.C. to protect religious freedom. And you saw Trump just a couple weeks ago bragging about how he had signed um, something in the law or something had, uh, so there was, there was uh, legislation moving forward on protecting religious freedom. And that's uh, the, the most disgusting euphemism ever because what it, of course, is really all about is giving Christians the right to, you know, in America, to have their way and to remove the walls of separation of church and state uh, under the guise of religious freedom. But that's, you know, that's kind of a whole separate topic. But I thought I would mention it here because that lobby and those efforts that are occurring there are not insignificant and they play a part in this whole picture of also how these cults, like Scientology, escape notice or escape uh, prosecution. So uh, that's, that's an answer for you. I know it's not a real super hopeful one, and I know it's a bad, you know, it kind of sucks. Um, and it does, you know, and it's why we keep fighting and keep putting it out there for you guys to see that these groups are out there, they are bad. And if we can get to you guys, and you guys can tell your friends and so on and so on and so on, right? Um, then these groups will die off. You know, it's slow going, but they will. They will die off on their own. Um, because, as I've said from the very, very beginning of putting content out here, their self-destruction is in their DNA. That works out not just for Scientology, but almost all these groups. Um, so many of them just implode all on their own. So eventually that is what's going to happen to Scientology. Some, come one way or another, that is what's going to happen eventually. I'm sure of that. Um, how long it takes, you know, how much patience we have to have, how many more abuses we have to hear about, how much more nonsense has to be exposed, that's a question, you know, and that's why we keep fighting the fight and we don't give up. So anyway, I hope that, I hope that gives some clarification on this uh, without making it sound like it's all hopeless because it's not all hopeless, but it is, it's a tough fight. Okay, everybody, that is our show for this week. Thank you very much for coming around and listening to me gab here. If you find my content informative, educational, and entertaining, please consider joining me on Patreon or supporting this channel through some other means because this is a fan-funded operation and you guys are what keeps me going. So thanks a lot for all of your feedback, your wonderful questions, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.